Hello again, friends. Welcome back. It is yet again my honor to introduce a distinguished guest. Professor Dana Robert is Truman Collins Professor of World Christianity and History of Mission and the Director of the Center for Global Christianity and Mission at Boston University. I cannot tell you all of the books that Professor Robert has published. It is a long list, so here are some of the highlights. She has written classic texts such as American Women in Mission, A Social History of Their Thought and Practice, another classic text, Christian Mission, How Christianity Became a World Religion, and future classics such as Faithful Friendships, Embracing Diversity in Christian Community. It's a prophetic word. Dr. Robert has been a Henry Luce Fellow, as well as a Senior Research Fellow at the Leibniz Institute. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and recently received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society of Missiology. It is our honor to have her here to give a keynote address this morning entitled Mission Studies and Global Christianity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dana Robert. It's a great honor to be here among so many new friends and old friends. And I want to thank the organizers of the conference, the sponsor of the conference, and my two colleagues who gave such excellent papers before me. They're hard acts to follow. I'm going to shift the subject a bit to the issue of the discourses around mission studies and world Christianity and look at these at three particular moments starting around 1910 to the present. I've selected this topic partly because I'm aware that I'm locate, we are located today in a, quote, mainline Protestant tradition seminary within a research university. So I'd like to talk about the discourses from the perspective of a North American mainline Protestant tradition. And that's, that's the source of the talk. Now, mission studies is known as the midwife for the academic field of Christianity, world Christianity. And I want to make this point by romping through the past century and tracing the intersection of mission studies and world Christianity as they developed as discourses. These overlapping discourses developed in tandem. And obviously, 45 minutes is not enough time to cover all of this, so I'll just be suggestive in terms of the points that I emphasize. But I've started by trying to make some charts for this talk as I was thinking through this issue. Both mission studies and world Christianity are interdisciplinary discourses. For folks I have studied, if you look at the overlapping circles in the middle, they, all, they both have prioritized initial encounters between Christians and whatever systems, religions, political situations exist and cultures. Both mission studies and world, the study of world Christianity focus on the global, local hybridities and are constantly aware of the local in the global and the global in the local. Both of them focus on transcultural agents, whether, that are, whether those are so-called missionaries or first generation, second generation indigenous Christians, migrants, and others who find themselves in the boundary crossing situations so, and are somewhat self-conscious about it. When the most race, recent iteration of the discourse of world Christianity emerged, it was to provide a corrective to the over-Europeanization of history of Christianity by focusing on Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So that's another piece of it, though that is, of course, now contested, and I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. If you look at mission studies, though, as it continues today, it focuses on boundary crossing witness and evangelization. So there is, and, and language and cultural competency 
are a big part of it. World Christianity focuses sometimes on post-colonial identities, as we saw in the two talks we've heard already. Post-colonial identities are a major, major focus in world Christianity, as well as religio-political movements, as illustrated so well by Professor Olaponer's talk about, about these things. Now, the institutions and professional societies also overlap in the two fields. So if you see your typical program in, say, mission studies or what's sometimes called intercultural studies, those might be located in Christian colleges, in missionary training institutes, and in theological seminaries. World Christianity as a field, or as an unfolding academic discourse, tends to be located in liberal arts colleges and research universities, in state universities, and in religious studies departments. The overlap here, and where a lot of the tension takes place, are in theological schools based in research universities, just like this one, where on the one hand we, have, we are helping Master of Divinity students lead their churches in the area of mission, where I'm a United Methodist, and all over the place our leaders are talking about, well, we may disagree on almost everything, but what unites us is mission. Now, what does that mean? Okay. Uh, these are urgent questions for people training for professional ministry. So mission studies is, is there. And then that overlaps with the concerns for world Christianity and things like post-colonial identities. So another place where you see overlapping discourses are in centers and research institutes, such as the one that um, M.L. Daniil and I founded in 2001, the Center for Global Christianity and Mission. Why do we have both of those in the title? Because in our post-colonial context, it's not just world Christianity that's post-colonial. Mission studies is also post-colonial. As, as mission goes to and from everywhere, mission studies is an emerging field in, say, Christian universities in Africa, in places where people are very aware of being on the cutting edge of boundary crossing in the Christian faith. And then professional societies attract a lot of overlapping discourse. Then a third thing might be methodologies and assumptions. Mission studies tends to, to focus on normative theological values. Therefore, it's somewhat an emic discourse to Christianity, whereas world Christianity uses, it focuses more on phenomenology and is edit to Christianity. We see sometimes mission studies located under practical theology in seminary curricula. This is very much the case in Africa and in a lot of places in Europe now who have moved from intercultural theology, sometimes in some cases back to mission studies. Um, so, whereas world Christianity focuses on comparative theology, comparative theologies, just the kind of things that Professor Kwok was talking about as essentially important. So I tried to put some of my thoughts into these three charts so as to help define that we're looking at a continuum with a lot of overlap, especially for a university-based divinity school. Now let me do my race through history looking at three particular points in time to see how this came about. First, let's look at 1910 and the birth of mission studies as a scholarly discourse. Here, I want to use an image of the original logo of the YMCA in, from 1881. Now, look carefully at this logo because the people who were in charge of the YMCA in the 1880s were the ones who were the head of mission agencies in 1910. Notice there's a world vision here. It's, and around the edges, you see America, Asia, Europa, um, Africa, Oceania. But in the middle, the verse from John 17, 21, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
Thus, global expansion and global unity, witness and awareness of a whole world are packaged together in this logo. Then you can see that when the young people of the YMCA grew up, they go and in 1910 the famous Edinburgh Missionary Conference occurred where the head of it was John R. Mott, who was what? The head of the world's YMCA. The late 18, early 1900s are a period of expansionism, of um, new technologies, and the steamship, railroad, and telegraph energize a, a mentality of globalization similar to the way that the internet and air travel have created that today. And a lot of the attention around Edinburgh 1910 has been focused on its world evangelization ideas. But I want to point to something else, namely how these scholarly discourses got a focus at that point. Study reports from around the world gave, using informants, both missionaries and indigenous Christian leaders, led to sets of the first big Protestant comprehensive study reports of Christ, the state of Christianity around the world. Atlases were produced, surveys were done. So you get the apparatus of what becomes academic discourse. There was a visible multiculturalism at Edinburgh 1910. Even though the so-called non-Western representatives were only about 20, they were vis very visible. The speeches were mo many by them and about them. So the imagination of an idea of a worldwide church is there. You can just see it bursting forth in the speeches of the people at the conference. The re one result of the conference is the professionalization of mission studies, where schools like this one appointed a professor of missions, a, a lot of them around 1910. And you had professional societies of people teaching mission studies, the journal International Review of Missions, so you get journals, professional societies, standards of professional behavior, and the introduction of social sciences into school curricula, partly for this kind of analysis that's needed for world mission. Another of the consequences is the birth of area studies. Now, we often leave this out of Edinburgh 1910. But a parallel to this, in the 20s and 30s especially, was the real just explosion of interest in documentation about Christianity in many different parts of the world and about religions in different parts of the world. So for example, um, and the missionaries and their protégés are spearheading this. So you've got the Reichauers and Japanese studies at Harvard, Kenneth Scott Lederat and Chinese studies at Yale. Dr. Kwok pointed to a book he wrote about Christian missions in China. He also wrote a two-volume history of China that became the standard text in liberal arts colleges right up to the mid-20th century. So you see people are working out of both sides of their kind of professional expertise here. Philip Hitty, who was a missionary protege and launches Near Eastern Studies at Princeton. I'll give one more example of a missionary, a YMCA missionary in the 19-teens, John Farquhar, literature secretary of the YMCA in India, who was fluent in Bengali and Sanskrit, commissioned and edited three book series on the history of Indian religions, folk customs, vernacular li and vernacular literature, putting Christianity in the mix as an Indian religion. So you see, that's an academic move to buy, buy missionaries to say Christianity was an Indian religion. It's not a, just a foreign religion. So all these kind of things are going on right up into the 20s and 30s. The operational models within Christianity were kingdom of God language and the idea of cooperation. These are probably the two main theological ideas that come out of this. Now we can see, in retrospect, the colonialist and Christendom assumptions of what was happening 100 years ago. And that's what we, need, we could continue to critique today. 
But at the time, this was important for the develop of mission studies, but not yet for world Christianity. There was, um, Europeans were over 70% of the world church. There was not yet an idea of something called world Christianity. That academic language was not used. Now let me jump to the mid 20th century. We've now vision, we've gone through World War II. And here we're into the age of ecumenism and I call it world Christianity phase one. And here I show you as an example of what this mentality looked like. You see the logo of the World Council of Churches. And what do you see here is it's a vision of unity that had been 20, 30, 40 years in the make since Edinburgh 1910, a vision of world unity of churches. And in this, I say, you see one cross, one mission, one world, um, the idea of one whole inhabited earth all together in one Christianity. This was a social vision as much as a theological vision. And um, we've had this, the question raised in the two speeches this morning. What is the social vision of world Christianity? How is, this re how is it relevant to us on the ground today? Those are the same questions in the different contexts that were being asked in the 1930s and 1940s when the term world Christianity starts to be used. And here I have two quotations from Representative but mainline Christian mission leaders, Henry Van Dusen, who was the Dean of Union Theological Seminary, also sponsored with Henry Luce Fons, the first non-Western, a Chinese scholar who taught world Christianity in the 40s at Union Seminary. And he wrote this book called World Christianity, where he says, you know, the, what happened during World War II is we got to see world Christianity in the middle of struggle. When, when American flyers are shot down in the South Pacific, they were rescued by Christians from the South Pacific who came to them and sang, Jesus loves me, and said, I'll hide you. Now, those are the kind of anecdotes that go into this vision of world Christianity that Henry Van Dusen lays out. But given the emerging, the, the urgency of totalizing worldviews, fascism on the one hand and communism on the other, what you see is a notion of world Christianity emerging to say Christians have a public witness. There needs to be a world Christian kind of global ethic. And so um, you can see this quote, Van Dusen says, only a world church is effective amidst planetary war. To an age destined to survive or to expire as one world, we bring a world church. So this idea, one world, one church, is, is very powerfully behind this phase one of discourse of world Christianity. Now I point to another, Edmund Soper, who is professor of missions, at Garrett, and he convened, he wrote that here's a quotation from him about moral order and the role of mission studies that's going to play in this kind of world Christianity vision. But one of the things about Soper, he wrote a book called Racism as a World Problem. This book has been touted by secular scholars as the beginning of an integrative view of global, of racism. And he wrote this book in the 1940s, but it was not noticed that he was actually a missionary and that what he's seeing, he puts in one book, apartheid, uh, segregation in the US, caste system, and says, world Christianity, we must, you know, we must deal with world racism. So this is, this is a global problem. So you see world Christianity kind of uh, taking off by the, by the 1950s, only to get sidelined by a little something called the Cold War. And I, and I won't get though, down that sideline, but to say how this vision of world Christianity gets completely obliterated by the Cold War, and then 
uh, the post-colonial period that follows immediately. Now, the high point of ecumenical, ec um, ecumenical optimism occurs in the early 1960s, where it looked like the Christians of the world are coming together. You have the first m meeting where the World Council of Churches and the International C Missionary Council have merged together in Mexico City called Witness in Six Continents. This is the first big meeting that the Orthodox are fully part of the whole World Council program. And they have a saying, taking the gospel to the whole world. The whole church takes the whole gospel to the whole world. And that one world, one church means one mission. That our mission to the world is to be united as Christians to witness to the values of Jesus Christ in the world today. Simultaneous is the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 65, which of course completely revolutionizes Catholic mission thought, including the fact that Protestants are no longer heretics, we're now just, quote, separated brethren, okay? So there's convergence, and after 65, you've got Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox coming together for all kind of projects. Now, Henry Van Dusen predicted that by the end of the century, and by the way, he's the one that coined the term the third force of Christendom as well, to refer to the emerging Pentecostal sects. He predicted that everybody except all Protestants would be united by the end of the 20th century, except for, oh, those Pentecostal sectarians who were quite small then, and the Roman Catholics. Um, this is why I never, I say, never predict. If you're a church historian, never answer a question about what will the future bring. Because as we know, that vision was somewhat stillborn. When you go back and read some of this material, it's incredibly exp inspiring from the 1960s, but world events overtook it. World Christianity was a failed discourse. It assumed a corporate unity that did not and could not exist in the mid-20th century. The decolonization of mission, the decolonization, just decolonization in general, occupied all of the energy, including self-criticism of mission by mainline Christians in the 1960s and 70s that completely blew up this idea of consensus history, unity of churches, um, church unity schemes failed one after another. Um, it was a sad day for church unity, but what was happening is partly there was a recognition that self-theologizing had not been part of the typical three selves of Christian mission. And people like Obu Kalu, who was head of the, the, the uh, joint church history project that took place. There were the people in regions of the world, Christian scholars in Africa and India and Latin America, started to collaborate for collaborative church history projects. He said, the theological task was so great, we just didn't have time to do church history. Decolonizing theology was the most important agenda in the 1970s. So consensus gives way to liberation, revolution, self-criticism, and the kind of blowing up of the colonial mission studies infrastructure. So what happens after that that brings us to the second phase of world Christianity? By the 1970s, the idea of world Christianity seemed like yesterday's leftover coffee, very stale and throwing and going down the drain. Amid cries of missionary go home by councils of churches in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the mission structure of Western mainline Protestantism declined or morphed into development agencies. Contextual and local theologies replaced these integrative models of ecumenical unity so beloved by their previous generations. Theolog theologians of pluralism rejected the idea of evangelism as itself a form of imperialism. In the meantime, an alternative 
evangelical mission movement is gaining strength in the 1960s and 70s and saying that the mainline vision has betrayed the unreached of the world. So you start to get a kind of this bifurcation, this split of the mission voice within mission studies. So in retrospect, the 60s to the 90s, you see decolonization and post-colonialism as the dominant kind of framework in which mission studies had, was operating, as well as the secularization narrative. Now, when I went to graduate school at, to Yale in the late 70s, in my mind, having grown up on, in the, next to the sugar cane fields in Plaquemine, Louisiana, I was interested in what, in my mind, I called comparative Christianity. It did not exist. If you, world Christianity did not exist as an academic discourse. If you, and if you were interested in world Christianity, here I'm talking about the secularized context of a Western seminary, you were seen as a kind of retrograde person. And this was, uh, these were the running dogs of imperialists, right? Why are you interested in that? So I'm just saying that the, the post-colonial critique had not yet moved to what Dr. Kwok is calling global modernity or a kind of shared post-colonial critique. So paradoxically though, while the secularization narrative starts to reign in, main, in mainline seminaries, Christianity, lo and behold, after the end of colonialism is growing rapidly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Who among scholars is on the scene to notice this? Missionaries, once again. So, here I point to someone like Andrew Walls, who was a missionary in Sierra Leone in the early 1960s, who, who is one of his most famous quotations is to say, here I was teaching my students about second Christ, century Christianity, and I realized we were living in second century Christianity. Okay, so he goes from West Africa in the early 60s back to Scotland, where in 1967, he founds the Journal of Religion in Africa. In 1970, he founded the Religious Studies Department at the University of Aberdeen. And who did he hire into that department? Adrian Hastings, the young Laman Sane, Harold Turner, the really great scholars of African Christianity at the time. So you see, he's a returned, we're talking about reverse mission. There's the reverse mission of the missionaries as well. Returns to the West with a different vision, tries to put into place something new. And then in 1982, he founded the Center of Christianity in the non-Western world. Notice the term world Christianity is still not what is used. It's non-Western Christianity. And th to put this in context, this is a time when the old positions in mission studies are being cut from every mainline seminary. So in 1971, R. Pierce Beaver was the last mission professor at the University of Chicago Divinity School and was not replaced. At Yale, the, where Kenneth Scott Lederette had directed many doctoral candidates, the splits between religious studies departments and theology schools meant that mission studies was put into the theology school at Yale and not allowed to be a doctoral program. You see, mission studies has been lumped as a churchy, a churchy discipline tied to old colonial models so we let those old guys retire, and then we eliminate their positions. And that's what happened here, and, and my own school, um, some at Yale. So this is the context in which someone like Andrew Walls is saying there's something different going on. By the 1970s, missiologists start to regroup and try to move in themselves into something of a post-colonial mode. And what's really interesting is to read the discourse, the conversations among the missiologists in the 1970s, where they're saying, we will be united, Catholics, evangelicals, and mainline. We are gonna unite, and they did, to found missiological professional societies, despite huge criticism by their constituencies. 
Evangelicals were accused of selling out to the Catholics. Catholics were accused of, of get, getting in bed with the sectarians. Mainline Protestant mission professors are, were accused of being engaged in irrelevant old-fashioned stuff. So, but there's a regrouping of the infrastructure of mission studies. Um, in the middle, you see Missionalia, the, the journal of the South African Missiological Society, also started at the same time under the great David Bosch. EAMS, International Association of Mission Studies, founded in 1972, same time period. Now, I think a kind of turning point where we're moving to a new period that makes possible a new discourse of world Christianity and of mission studies is 1989. A lot of things happen in 1989. The Cold War ends. This really releases theological studies from captivity to issues that were defined by the Cold War. Things like nationalism come forth, things like um, theology in relation to local culture is now important all of a sudden. So that happens. Then we've got a bunch of church meetings. The Lausanne movement, the world evangelical movement, met in Manila and incorporates Pentecostal voices for the first time. That's huge for global evangelicalism. The World Council of Churches Mission Wing met. And then there's a papal encyclical in 1991, Redemptoris Missio, that's all, all connected to that. Then we have the book that's already been mentioned by two people already by Professor Lamansani in 1989, who wrote a book called Translating the Message, in which he, as an African from a Muslim background, argued that Bible translation itself was not a colonial act as much as an act of liberation and handing over power to indigenous Christians. Now, that book was published in the ASM, the American Society of Missiology series, published by Orbis Press. And, less, and, less, and just a reminder, Orbis Press, which published all the liberation theology, a lot of it, is the mission press of the Mary Knowles, Mary Knollers. So you see, there's an, there's a, a, an intersection. The mission people um, are interested in, are, are working in post-colonial context and seeing this explosive growth of world Christianity. Then the Overseas Ministry Studies Center um, and here is where this is, I want to point, talk to the, about this now because this is proof of if you pay for it, they will come. <laughs> and the Overseas Ministry Study Center in the mid-1980s, was late 80s, was invited to make a proposal to the Pew Charitable Trusts for a study program, a kind of worldwide program to start studying Christian mission studies in relation to Christianity around the world. Now, that ended up being a program that through the 1990s put something like $18 million into the study of what we now call world Christianity. And that's when the term world Christianity reemerged, 1992. And here was a selection committee for 110 projects. You will see a much younger me on the left but who else do you see? John Poby. You see Jose Miguez Bonino. You see, da you see David Kerr, the great scholar of Middle Eastern Christianity and Islam. Paul Hebert, missionary anthropologist from India, Mennonite. Um, Bob Frickenberg, Indologist from the University of Wisconsin. Dan Bays, uh, China Studies uh, uh, Sinologist and Mary Mott of the Franciscan Missionaries of Mary. This is the group we spent the 1990s giving money to people like Peter Fine and others to study projects and brought everybody together for seminars to talk about how does each of these little individual projects relate. And out of that kind of conversation came this new vision of what by 1992 is called World Christianity. Now, the first incident of that, uh, okay, was in a conference that was held at, called the Yale Edinburgh Conference, 1992, that took the name from Christendom to World Christianity. That was the anniversary of the Columbus Conquest, I mean, the Columbus 
you know, invasion of the Americas. So to do that several hundred year anniversary, the scholars of mission history and mission, some mission anthropology and others came together to say, let's chart a new path. We're going from Christendom to world Christianity. And Laman Sani takes, took credit for having mentioned, said, we're going to call it world Christianity. And by the end of the 1990s, you start seeing that language popping up a little bit. And here the discourse, academic discourse, starts to spread through professional societies where people who've gotten these grants and others are giving papers. Now, in, the, in 1999, Laman Sani and I were invited to give plenary addresses at the American Society of Church History on the state of, what, what is happening. Um, and so we both, that's when I then wrote a paper called Shifting Southward, which then kind of used that term to talk about global Christianity. By 2005, the AAR has started a world Christianity kind of study group. Then you've got centers being founded in the West. We founded the Center for Global Christianity and Mission in 2001, around the same time that the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell moved to Gordon-Conwell. And this is what the group that does most of the documentation and statistics that we read online about world Christianity. But the real kind of um, incendiary move, you know, the, the, what do you call it, like the kerosene on the fire that blows the whole thing open is Philip Jenkins' book, The Next Christendom, which comes out in 2001 because suddenly he popularizes an idea that these um, missiologists and others are talking about for 20 years already. And you, you have to give him huge credit. This is what, after that, you see an exponential spread of the language of world Christianity. Oh, and here's that conf uh, conference a few years ago. Okay, um, let's see, let me see where I am in my notes. Um, okay, as the new academic discourse begins to spread, what are some of the issues that it faces? Well, we've already heard reference to the issue of nomenclature. What's the scope of this? Who's teaching it? What, do, what does it involve? What's it called? And it's interesting because uh, Laman Sonny and Andrew Walls both want to use the, world, the term world Christianity bec because they assume it includes a kind of multiculturalism that the term global does not. I think they're wrong there. Actually, I think world and global are often used interchangeably. Um, but the point of the other point behind it is Professor Sani said we don't want Christians in Africa to feel like they're just some um, third world variety of Christians. The core, the core of the community is there. So we want to call it all world Christianity. Now, then the term global Christianity is the one that um, we, I chose to use at BU and other places, partly because I, it, the word global, it was already in academic you know, ling, lingo. There were a lot of global this and that in various academic institutions. And also, can you study world Christianity without studying the intersection of local and global? Is it just ethnography? If it's just ethnography, is it world Christianity or global Christianity? Or is it somehow self-conscious about global and local intersections in everything that's going on? Now, one of the, pro so, and then we started to see the plural, world Christianities, largely driven by Western academics. But uh, I asked my colleague, Bob Hefner, do you ever talk about world Islams, he says, absolutely not. That would be to deny what Islamic scholars would see is Islam. So there are actual theological things at stake as to whether to call a chair or whatever, world Christianity, world Christianities, this conference is global Christianities. Those are some things Language actually has a meaning in the kind of academic discourse, and those are things that need to be parsed out a little bit. 
Then there's the Euro European contribution to the contribution to the, to the discussion where you've got the problem of language where Christendom, for example, just means, Chris, it sounds like Christendom, which is a bad word in English, uh, but Christentum just means Christentum Christianity. So European scholars are pointing out that they're lang linguistically global Christianity, world Christianity tends to be an English language way of putting something, of symbolizing, moving the theological and um, scholarly curricula outside of the West. So these, these issues are not um, all resolved. Now for an image though of what global Christianity looks like practically, I now want to use this logo of the Global Christian Forum. This is a group, a movement sponsored by the World Council of Churches, the World Evangelical Alliance, and the Vatican, where there are just conversations around the world where Christians of different persuasions can sit in a room and talk about what Jesus Christ means to them. The head of the Global Christian Forum is Casely Esamua, who's from Ghana. And I would like to point out how this logo differs from the WCC logo. Notice the cross is a mosaic. This is pointing to the nature of what world Christianity is now, which is a mosaic, a variety of tough colors and tiles and things that together create something, to, um, a religion together. So where are we now? Now I'm just going to wrap up with a few points. In 2010, all different constituencies held big meetings to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Edinburgh 1910. S perhaps surprisingly, that led to an absolute proliferation and explosion of the rebirth of mission studies. You know, in other words, it was, you know, you start with a question, will anybody show up? and end up with 35 different volumes that came out of the Edinburgh 2010 study process on all kind of topics of mission and, mission and, mission and, mission in all different traditions. Because So what is clear now is mission studies itself in the context of, world, of a multicultural world Christianity, it must itself decolonize. Mission studies itself if, if mission is to and from everywhere, then the study of mission is to and from everywhere. So that hints this just kind of, in the context of world Christianity language, a, a big movement of new kinds, new forms of uh, mission studies. Now, so where we are now with the language of world Christianity, I just want to throw out a few questions to end with. It's interdisciplinary, and so how do we parse that when it comes to something like an appointment? Is it, is it uh, ethnography? Is it, it, there's a question, the third question I have here. Should the global or the local be the priority? Okay, now that's a very academic question. We all know why you shouldn't do it that way, but when we think about it, that's what we do as scholars. And people at, say, Cambridge University who do world Christianity say we must focus on the integration. It's not the study of world Christianity unless it's the interconnections. Then, often this uh, recent Princeton conferences where they've had in the last two years is often saying, well, ethnography or the local is what we ought to be focusing on when we're studying world Christianity. So what's the balance there? The other thing is what happens then, uh, my own concern, university-based theological schools, how do we teach this? What language do we use? Are we ranging across discourses, teaching different kinds of courses? That's what I do. I'm teaching intro to mission to MDiv students who are required by their churches to take it and need to be able to go into a parish and talk about mission in some kind of intelligent way. And of course, that class is 40% international students who really care about mission studies. Then on the other hand, you teach courses in African Christianity, women in world Christianity, and things that you could say maybe are more, quote, academic or secular or neutral, maybe yes, maybe no. So these are questions that we have now. 
So when I began my PhD program in 1978, there was no such field as world Christianity. So where did I go for guidance? I went to those elderly missionaries who were hanging on to their academic positions and they were able to open a whole nother world. And people like George Lindbeck, who, who was one of my two advisors, who grew up as a missionary kid in China. His whole post-liberal theology comes out of his mission experience of growing up under Japanese propaganda and studying as, and trying to figure out as a teenager what's truth and what's not. So those, the mission studies very much midwifed the next generation of what is now we're calling world Christianity, which is now way bigger than mission studies and, and um, moves into different places mission studies won't move into. But in my talk, I've tried to argue how they're actually closely related. It was not interdisciplinary. 
And for 30 years, I've been sitting and looking at this picture of anthropologist, sinologist, demonologist, <laughs> missiologist. I was in religious studies. When we gave grants deliberately, it was the purpose that even Andrew Wall stated at the beginning was to have an interdisciplinary conversation and to bring them together because mission studies could no longer sit in a silo. It, it was irrelevant if it's in a silo. And so, uh, so when I see young people are writing things about, well, this, they didn't do this and they didn't do that, and, and I was there, and that's what we thought we were doing. <laughs> so I, I, that's why I just put that picture and realize I'm, I'm you know, the one, last one standing of that old committee. <laughs> <laughs> I still say anything about that. Good, thank you. Uh, Joe? Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, I want to go back to some of the interesting points you raised about nomenclature and especially about the issue of talking about Christianity in the plural, as we have for obviously the conference title. Um, and I'm wondering when you said that many would object to talk about Islam in, in the plural, it strikes me that a lot of Christians would also object to Christianity in the plural, especially given the um, the ideal of unity that you mentioned in John 17. So I'm, I'm wondering on a specifically theological level, what, are, what would be the potential theological gains of talking about it in the plural? But conversely, also like the difficult. That's a really good question. Now, Michael McClyman and I went back and forth trying to trace the first term of the plural for Christianities. And it goes back to scholarship not that long ago on early Christianity to make the point that there was always a variety of, of types of Christianity, and it also has been closely associated with sex and non-Orthodox Christianity. And for my set, where I sit in a secular research university that also has a theology school, people in religious studies want to use the plural in order to reduce Christianity to phenomenology, and, they, and I've had this argument, world Christianity does not exist, they say. Now, that's a, that's a point that can, is being made in religious studies departments, so it must be a plural. And then from within Christianity, that innervates, that, that re, from a theological perspective, that undercuts what you think Jesus said and did and what you think Christianity is about. So there actually is something at stake in that discussion. A lot of people use the term plural because they think they're being trendy. And they just haven't thought through, okay, what's the theological implication of saying there are lots of different little Christianities and no, no, uh, no unifier? What does our global local language allow us to do? Now, I'm not going to answer the, that question really. At BU, we just say global Christianity which has again been criticized by Laman and Andrew as being too totalizing. But I, dis I disagree with them. I think that word global at least gets at that it's not just ethnography. As important as local Christianity is, there's the global and the local, the local and the global. So I leave that to you all here at the University of Chicago, what you call your new chair, but there is something at stake as to how you all decide to name it. You need to kind of sort out what your what your goals are there. Uh, yeah. Um, Dara, thank you so very much for good information studies and highlighting the importance of mission studies for the study of world Christianity. Uh, I have a quick comment to make about your observations about World Mission Conference 1910 in Edinburgh as the beginning of kind of world Christianity, they document the thing. I wonder what will you place all the regional and national conferences that were held, according to the missionary conferences that were held in, in India, what are the significance of those conferences for the study of world Christianity? Yes. Well, one of the things that as we think about world Christianity, you don't usually go from local to global. There's a lot in between. Mm -hmm. and, the, and those world missionary conferences, I mean missionary conferences within countries and regions, as well as the family of councils of churches 
in countries and regions after Edinburgh 1910 created conversations around what is our Christianity as, as different peoples in this region walking together. Now what's really interesting, so those are incredibly important. That's what gave rise to these various church history projects like Sahila and Chai and, and, and all of these. But, it, but there are also theological tensions there. So one, one uh, move of, I would say, mostly the Westerners in the 1970s in the face of anti-colonial movements was to say, well, we're not going to talk about our traditions as global, the world Lutheran whatever, the world Methodist whatever. Whereas D.T. Niles, for example, who was Sri Lankan, and others who were connected with the Asian Council of Churches said, no, we don't want to be just absorbed into sort of global Methodism or global Lutheranism or global Baptist whatever fellowship. We assert our own regional cultural Christianity. So that the, the, the critical Asian principle and, and, you know, Shoki Ko uh, coined the term contextualization in around 1972 or 3. And then the, the critical Asian principle in 1976. These were moves by regional groups of Christians to say that our Christianity, we actually have more in common together than those di differences that were brought to us by missionaries that stemmed from the Reformation. Now, this tension has not been resolved, <laughs> and um, what you sometimes see is people using the global denominational structures as power grabs, with Westerners or whoever using them as ways to try to enforce things on Christians in other cultures. So I think the, the regional approach that you're pointing to with meetings of um, both missionaries, indigenous Christians, councils of churches, these are, are hugely important in part of the um, ecumenical creation of what we, can, we now call world Christianity. And that's why the Global Christian Forum is so important. In the face of all this growth, you've now got a new ecumenism, though people don't want to use that word ecumenism, okay? That's an old-fashioned word now. But a new movement of unity where people of all different denominations in the same region will sit down together and talk about what they have in common. That's absolutely essential for public theology and for the future of the Christian movement. Thank you. So we have more questions than we have time, which is a good problem to have. Uh, I want us to thank Professor Robert again, but hold on one second. Let me make an announcement, and then we can just wrap up right now. Uh, we've had what I think is an extraordinarily rich morning of papers and discussion. We get to continue that during our lunch. So the lunch is downstairs on the first floor in the common room. If you're not sure where that is, uh, just don't be the first one to get there. Follow me. <laughs> uh, and we will then reconvene back up here at one o'clock. Uh, but before we do that, Let's give a warm thank you to Professor Robert.